Hi, and thank you for tuning in to Noir Histoire. I'm Natasha, and in this episode, I'll be discussing Three and a Half Minutes, Ten Bullets. Three and a Half Minutes, Ten Bullets is a 2015 Sundance winning documentary that tells the story of the shooting death of Jordan Davis in Jacksonville, Florida. To be more precise, the documentary dives into the events leading up to the murder of Jordan Davis and the resulting trial of Michael Dunn. As is to be expected with these types of documentaries, we get a bit of background in Davis from his parents and friends as they look back over his life. But what really sets this documentary apart from others is its exploration of how Dunn attempted to manipulate the events leading up to the shooting to take advantage of Florida's controversial Stand Your Ground law. Through taped audio from when Dunn was being held in prison, we learn a bit about what happened from his perspective during the phone call conversation between him and his fiance. It's absolutely sickening to hear this man whine about how hard things are for him while completely glossing over having ended someone's life. That you're supposedly in fear for your life, kill someone, and then just go about your day and relax in your hotel room with your fiancé, having drinks and eating pizza like nothing happened. So, the gist of the situation is that on an evening in 2012, Jordan Dunn, along with a few of his friends, were parked in a gas station parking lot where they were listening to music. One of the kids went into the store, um, the owner of the vehicle, went into the store to use the bathroom and make some purchases. And while Jordan and the other guys were sitting in the vehicle, they were listening to music rap music. According to some, it was loud. Might very well have been. But when Michael Dunn pulled up with his fiance, um, who then went into the store to make a purchase of her own, a disagreement ensued that then resulted in an exchange of words. That then moved on from just an exchange of words to Dunn shooting into the vehicle and striking Jordan Davis multiple times, where he then died at the scene. According to Dunn, he felt that Jordan Davis verbally threatened his life, and physically as well as it's unclear, or at least to him it's unclear, but within the loud music and him asking them to turn it down, that initially it was turned down, but Davis then turned it back up and told his friends using not so polite language, forget about this guy. You know, we don't have to listen to him and then turn the music back up. Dunn then stated that he was unclear if it was coming from Jordan Davis or the music, but that there was violent language and whatnot about kill whoever, and he thought that Jordan Davis was speaking about him, at which point feeling threatened that he reached into his glove box for a firearm. At some point, he looked over and also felt that Davis was getting out of the vehicle and thought that he saw the barrel of a gun. And realistically, under most circumstances, one would think if you feel threatened in a situation like that, you would drive away or you would move your vehicle, something along those lines. I know from my personal experience, if I drive up to a situation that looks a little bit sketchy, I'm most likely not going to get out the car. I'm not really bothered by people's loud music. I hear stuff like that all the time when I go to the gas station. And a lot of times I don't like the music either, but I've never ventured to tell someone else to turn their music down as I don't hang out at the gas station. I don't live there. So it's like at most, if I'm there to pump gas or maybe to use the restroom or purchase a snack or something along those lines to buy something from like a convenience store, I'm there for typically five, maybe 10 minutes at the most. I'm in and out of there. It's not enough time for me to be bothered by this. I know that within a few short minutes, I'm going to be driving away from here, so I don't really care. It's not a big deal. But I've pulled up to look around the area and it just looks sketchy. And I might say to myself, like, you know, I don't feel safe here or something like that. You know, like when you pull up and you do that quick scan around, and unless it's like I absolutely have to, where it's like whatever business I have to take care of has to be done there. I'll pull off and go somewhere else or I'll figure something else, you know, figure out something else rather than stopping at this place. If you don't like the music and it's loud and you're really just there for your fiance to run into the store and grab a bottle of wine, how long are you really going to be there for? You know, couldn't you just ignore it for the few minutes that she's in the store? Or couldn't you just move your car to another spot that's a little bit further away, away from them? There's a host of other people. There's employees there as well. Why do you feel the need to be the one to tell them to turn it down? Why is that such a big deal? Like you're just going to be there for a few minutes. Just sit there, wait for your fiance to come out and then go on about your business. We all go through life and people do things that annoy us. And it's like, it's different if it's something within your house, you know, so like if your neighbor is blasting ridiculously loud music or being noisy, especially at night, it's reasonable to ask them to turn it down. But it's like 
You're out in public at a gas station, someplace where you're only going to be for a few minutes. I don't see the need to take it upon yourself to attempt to police the situation. You're a regular citizen like everyone else. Why do you feel the need to go and demand that they turn the music down? And even if you ask them, they then turn it back up. Like, just, like, consider the person as a jerk and just leave it there. Why not just leave well enough alone rather than continuing to instigate the situation? Until you said something, they weren't paying you any mind. They weren't being aggressive towards you. They're just sitting in their car listening to this loud music. Why take it upon yourself to create a situation where there was no need for one? You don't know these kids. You don't have any relation to them. You're just going to be there for a few minutes. It's like you're going out of your way to create a situation where there was really no need for you to have contact with them. You could have sat in your car, minding your business, rolled your eyes, and everyone could have just driven away from the situation. But what you find, especially within the last few years, not necessarily like the police-involved shootings, but more so like these citizen-involved shootings, um, especially when they involve like unarmed black people, is that there's this sense of authority that some white people have, or just people in general, really, where there's this attitude within society that you have the authority to dictate to other people, black people especially, what they should or should not do, right? There are things that might be admittedly annoying, you know, but it's not your place to police everyone. You are a rank and file citizen like everyone else. If the person isn't, you know, posing a threat to someone or something like that, just mind your business and go on about your day. In situations like this, there's no worse, like there's no real danger to anyone. There's no real reason for you to intervene. Now, let's say if they were like brandishing guns or something, you know, where there's a threat of violence, someone's safety or security might be in danger. That's a different situation. And even in a situation like that, I don't think that you would approach them to tell them like, hey, you know, we'll put your guns away. I would think the smarter thing would be to call the police, you know, maybe alert employees in the gas station to the situation. I really don't think that you would operate in this way if there was a real and serious threat. You probably wouldn't take it upon yourself to approach, you know, like a bunch of armed people to de-escalate the situation. Why? Because you're not a police officer. In a situation like this, if they were blasting the music really loud and you felt really upset about it, why didn't you go into the gas station to let one of the attendants know and have them deal with it? On a whole, I don't even understand why do you have to be the one to to say something about it like who gave you the authority no one's life is in danger why can't you just mind your business it's like the gas station is not your property you don't own the, the gas station it's just these multiple instances of people overreaching what you find is that they pick and choose who they do these kinds of things with it's like i remember it's probably a few years ago now where you had a family that was at like a park I can't remember if they were barbecuing or what exactly it was, but this lady walks up to them, cell phone in hand, and starts dictating to them about what they can and can't do in the park. She then gets on the phone with the police and completely misrepresents the situation where she's actually the aggressor. She's the one that approached them, and at the same time, she's telling the police that she feels threatened. And it's this thing that you notice in many of these situations where... Fortunately, most of them haven't ended in death or outright violence, but it's like this thing of you approach someone when there's no real need for you to, right? If you feel threatened, if you feel there's something going on that's wrong or could be harmful to someone else, you have a cell phone in your hand. You can call the police. It's not on you to, it's not for you to go and intervene. You know, I don't know if it's ego if it's their self-centeredness, their sense of entitlement, their sense of being above the law, a need to control, a feeling of superiority, or whatever it is, where they feel the need to get involved and to dictate to everyone else what they should or should not be doing. It's very much a similar situation to Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman, where it's like, you're not a police officer, you're not a security guard for this area. Even if you're a resident, why does anyone have to answer to you? It's another frequent thing that you find where we have these instances of black people in different communities, whether it's that they're visiting or they live in the community, something along those lines, where you have some people, they'll see a black face 
in a place where they feel it doesn't belong and they call the police. They report the person as being suspicious. That's problematic enough, but okay, fine. At least you didn't approach them aggressively or something like that. You alerted the police. It's, it's problematic still, but it's like, then you have these people who go even further where just the sight of black people existing in the world, especially if that person is doing something that they don't approve of, whatever it is, it's an issue. Really, the problem is that, you know, just existing is more the issue where they'll take it upon themselves to approach that black person and question them about why they are where they are. You know, what are they doing? Where are they going? All this kind of stuff. Things that you wouldn't think to stop and ask a white person if you saw them. Because it's like, there's this, it's a sense of superiority. That might not be the word, but rather this sense of endowed authority where it's like they feel they have the right to question this person. This person is obligated to answer to them. And the reality is that's not true. That's social conditioning, right? That's not like a legal right because you're not a police officer. And even if you're a police officer, if you're walking down the street, the police generally don't have the right to just stop and question you and search you and whatnot, especially since in a lot of jurisdictions, they've stopped these, you know, these, they've eliminated these stop and frisk type laws because they've been taken off the books because of the degree of prejudice inherent within them. You have a lawful right of protection against unlawful search and seizure. Every citizen within the country does. You're not obligated to answer to anyone that stops you on the street to question you about why you're in a particular place or not, or to detain you to get information from you, especially if like they're not a member of law enforcement and you're not committing a crime. But yet you have these repeated situations of everyday citizens because they've been emboldened by society, by other similar examples, they take it upon themselves to stop and question and make demands of people they feel they have power and authority over. And so you have it in this situation. You have it in the Trayvon Martin situation where this person takes it upon themselves, this unauthorized authority figure creates a situation that unnecessarily becomes hostile and violent ending in someone's death. And as with the Trayvon Martin situation where this stand your ground law was at play, it's present here as well. It's this fallback that people use where by default people are guaranteed or they're granted the right to self-defense. You have a right to defend your life and liberty where if your life is under threat, someone's trying to do you harm, you have the right to defend yourself, to protect your life. But in these situations, people manipulate the law because they create the situation of potential violence. In this case, approaching these guys and telling them to turn down their music, or rather not approaching them, but demanding that they turn down their music. It's like you started the interaction. It seems like for all intents and purposes, until Michael Dunn said something to Jordan Davis and his friends, they weren't interacting with him. They weren't paying him any mind. They didn't say anything to him or do anything to him. What started the interaction was him telling them to turn down the music. And with that, it sounds like because of this sense of authority that he felt, where he had the right to demand that they turn down the music, Jordan turning the music back up and mouthing off to him made him feel like his authority wasn't being respected, that his authority was being questioned. And from that place of insecurity, he then felt like, well, I'm going to show you, which further escalated the situation. And because Dunn escalates the situation, he's the only person firing a gun. He then has to have some explanation as to why this thing happened. You know, they weren't trying to rob him. They didn't approach his vehicle. They didn't surround his vehicle. So then what was the reason for you shooting this kid? Prior to you firing your gun, it was just an exchange of words. What's the rationale for turning this into a violent event? And it's at this point that you then kind of have this this backpedaling into creating a story about him being under threat, which is something that you unfortunately find in the circumstances where the person that does shoot, right, that is actually the aggressor, they start the situation, they instigate the situation. And because there's no real need for it, 
there's no real need for him to speak to Jordan Davis and his friends. You now have on the back end where they're trying to come up with this story to explain their actions, to provide some kind of context or justification for shooting Jordan Davis. And this is where the trouble with the stand your ground law comes in, where despite people having the right to self-defense, traditionally there's been limitations on that, where you're allowed to use force to defend yourself, but to a point, right? To the point that the threat no longer exists. And as part of that, there's also traditionally been an expectation that if there's an option between confronting your attacker or retreating, that you would have a duty to retreat, that you would only use force and effort like in aims of self-defense if you had no other option. Meaning that if you're boxed in, you're cornered, and they have a gun, you have a gun, and you shoot back, fine, fair enough. But if someone is two blocks away, you have a car, and you instead choose to walk towards them, Traditionally, there's an expectation that you would remove yourself from the situation and seek safety as a means of defending your life and liberty rather than continuing or pursuing this confrontation. And so it's like in some states you have this thing of um, castle doctrine where within your home you're not obligated to retreat, which is realistic because it's like if you're at home, it's the middle of the night, someone breaks in, you shouldn't have to run out of your house. You have some means to defend yourself. Like you can go ahead and do so, but to a point, there's a simplified explanation of castle doctrine where it's like you have a right to defend yourself within your home, but that's not the situation at play here. Even within the stand your ground law where it's like you have a right to stand and defend yourself, that's not really the situation that's going on here, or at least not at face value, which is why you then have this thing of Michael Dunn's defense trying to back into the story of him feeling threatened. This despite him being the aggressor and the instigator in the situation. He's the one that sets these events in motion because had he just remained in his vehicle and not said anything to Jordan Davis and his friends, there would have been no confrontation. Jordan's friend would have returned to the vehicle and they would have driven off and gone about their business. Dunn's fiance would have returned to the vehicle and they would have gone about their business. Even at that point where they've turned down the music and, you know, Jordan then turning back up the music and trash talking, Dunn could have left the situation. These are young 17 year old guys in the vehicle. And I'm not saying that, you know, Jordan was right or he was wrong or anything like that, but you're an adult. I don't understand you getting into an argument of this nature with kids. And especially it's like, fine, an exchange of words is one thing, but I don't understand this need then for you to pull a gun out on them. You know, it's like you said, you thought that you heard Jordan say, you know, kill him or whatever, and he was using threatening language towards you. And then it's like this next thing of, oh, I thought I saw the barrel of a gun and he looked like he was getting out of the vehicle. All of this stuff just being added on as you think of it. And then it's like the autopsy reports come in and come to find out that what he said can't really be shown through the evidence. For most of this incident, it was just an exchange of words. It would have boiled down to Michael Dunn versus Jordan Davis's word. And Jordan isn't here to say what happened. His friends backed up that yes, there was an exchange of words between the two of them and Jordan dismissed this guy, but they didn't corroborate the rest of these allegations. And the evidence doesn't point to that either. And it's like, at that point you have, I'm guessing it's probably like a medical examiner, a pathologist or something like that, who testifies during the trial that given the trajectory of the bullets into the vehicle and now they hit him, there's no way it could have hit him there if, you know, the car door was open and he was attempting to get out of his vehicle or was standing. It's like, if you imagine this is an SUV, it's elevated, right? They tend to be up off the ground. If he's sitting in the back seat and they show you where the bullet strikes him, like his legs, his groin area and whatnot, if he's getting out or he's standing at the back door of the vehicle and these are bullets that have come in through the car door, if he was getting out of the vehicle, you would expect that the bullets would have hit him, all of the bullets that is, would have hit him higher up in the body. You wouldn't have these these um, bullet wounds low in the lower part of the body. And this is just me surmising right? When you look at it, even if let's say he was getting out of the vehicle, instead of you reaching over to your glove box to get your gun, why don't you just throw the car into gear and drive off? 
it's it, it's it just comes across as like grasping at straws coming up with different theories different excuses for your actions hoping that the jury would buy something now granted there's some back and forth about when exactly dumpsters and bushes and things like that nearby were searched but for all intents and purposes it sounds like they pulled off when Dunn started firing which like I said is what Dunn could have and should have done when he felt or supposedly felt threatened right if he didn't want to sit next to them and listen to the music he should have driven off it seems that there were cameras nearby and between that and probably witness statements as well as statements from the other guys in the car is that they didn't drive off. They didn't leave the gas station complex. They simply drove away to get away from the gunfire. They didn't have the opportunity to dump a rifle. It's like they pulled out of one spot and then drove some distance away, likely just trying to get away from this man that was firing at the vehicle, but stayed within the same like gas station it's like it's unfortunate because what you realize is that in years past that used to be enough for someone to get away with a crime of this nature where they're the instigator they create the situation they fire 50 million bullets and things like that while the other person is unarmed doesn't have a weapon of any kind and their way of explaining the situation away is to say that they felt threatened it's to say that they felt their life was in danger because of those precedents where you watch these situations on the news and in years past the person wouldn't even be charged or they'd be charged but it'd be with like some lesser crime or something like that or they'd get a slap on the wrist basically the case would go away with them saying that they felt threatened i think it's emboldened people to interact in this way, to take on this perceived sense of unauthorized authority, knowing that they could fall back or hoping that they could fall back on this excuse of feeling threatened should things go wrong. This belief that they have the right to dictate to black people what they can or can't do, to be the aggressor in these situations, knowing that they can then call the police and tell them that they felt threatened, they feel unsafe, you know, or I see this suspicious character, and then nine times out of 10, they're going to be believed. And if it goes to trial, it's like they just have to further build upon that story and they'll get off scot-free. And so within the documentary, you get the telling of this story. But the unfortunate thing is the details differ, but the overall gist of the story has been repeated in multiple situations, some of which have received media attention and I think one of the most well-known is the Trayvon Martin case. But then it's like, you think about in the years past, right? The amount of these situations that didn't receive media attention or were otherwise swept under the rug. If you think of like the Ahmaud Arbery case is another such situation. This thing of these regular people making themselves into unofficial authority figures where they see a black person and either they think the person is suspicious or doesn't have a right to be where they are or the person's doing something that they don't approve of and because of society and past historic norms and trends they feel endowed with the authority to stop this person to dictate to them what they should or should not be doing you know rather than if need be getting the police involved or even in some situations they unnecessarily get the police involved it just it manifests in a few different ways but at the core this is really it's acts of prejudice and racism, where as a member of a privileged group within this society that receives certain protections from, be it the justice system or, you know, um, and it's historic, like excessive protection from the justice system. In these cases, it's given me the feeling, the sense of authority that I can do what I want. I can go above and beyond my rights as a citizen and dictate to other people what they do. If need be, I can exert my authority under the threat of violence or actually carrying out acts of violence because I've seen and I've been led to believe that the justice system will back me as long as I state that I feel threatened or I felt unsafe or or I was doing this in defense of my life or someone else's life. And fortunately, in this situation, while there was some back and forth over charges in the original, um, like the first trial, the main charge ended up in mistrial, Dunn was eventually convicted. But even with that, it's like, you know, sure, you get some legal justice, but Jordan Davis has already lost his life. Like, none of this is going to bring him back. 
I don't know what, if any, ease this case might have brought his parents, but I'm sure they would have preferred for their son to still just be alive, for their son to have not gone through this situation, for their son to have not been killed. And so it's like, justice after the fact, it's justice, yes, but it doesn't bring a loved one back. That's the real hurt. That's the pain, you having lost your loved one. In this case, you've lost your child, you've lost your friend, you've had to go to court to, to try to get justice for them. You have to sit there and listen to the prosecution, sit there and listen to the defense, argue this stuff out, you know, and listen to the defense in particular, try to denigrate your child. And sure, at the end of it, fortunately, there's a conviction, but it still doesn't bring your child back. It doesn't bring your loved one back. Every so often, there would be one of these situations of an unarmed black person being killed in, you know, not just the police, but even with just rank and file everyday citizens. And then them relying on this thing, this kind of wink and nudge protection of, I feared for my life. And in more recent years with Noir Histoire, having read more into black history, various books about economics, not just the civil rights movement, but other local movements and learning about more of these situations and circumstances, it's like it really opened your eyes to just how pervasive and deep this pen, just how pervasive and deep this mentality runs. This history where there's this feeling, this belief of unauthorized authority. But when you dive deeper into it, when you look into the history of these kinds of situations where things along these lines, these kinds of justifications were used in the past for lynchings, things of this nature were used to explain why people were being lynched. It's a deepened and very pervasive and long-standing history. There's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot that has to be addressed beyond just the laws. I highly recommend watching this documentary because sure, from a true crime and an understanding of the legal system perspective, it's very informative. You'll learn a lot here and it's very, it's an interesting case. But from a historical standpoint, when you view it in the broader context of lynching in America, the broader context of the inequality of the justice system, it raises a lot of questions. And I think you'll come away from it asking yourself a lot of questions. It's a very interesting documentary, and I think it's quite well put together. In watching it, I think it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily transformative because I don't think there's really any new information here, but rather that seeing everything put together in this way, in this cohesive way, especially in context of the standard ground law, I think it can lead to having some pretty deep questions and conversations. And so with that, I highly recommend the movie. Three and a half bullets, 10 minutes. Thanks for tuning in. Show notes are available on the Noir Histoire website by the link in the episode description. If you enjoyed this episode and want more, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and check out my movie review playlist.